I'm Michelle Ackley. My parents both grew up on council estates, and as a family, we understand the difference social housing can make to people's lives. Millions of families across the UK are struggling to find affordable housing. So this is my front room and my bedroom together. Many are living in temporary or overcrowded conditions, desperate for somewhere decent to live. This is our room where we sleep, and this is what we've got at the minute. We can't really call it our home. But some social housing tenants are abusing the system, holding on to properties they no longer need. When somebody applies for housing, you expect them to live in a property, and when they don't, it does start to take the mickey. Or even worse, making a small fortune by illegally subletting them. He was charging beyond £1,500 a month. He exploited this completely to his advantage. So I'm with housing investigators cracking down on tenancy cheats. What a waste. If you want to commit tenancy fraud, don't bother coming here. Reclaiming properties. I need to uh, speak to you, please. They see an opportunity and they think they're not going to get caught. And giving them to families in genuine need. That's how a council house should be. It should be loved and looked after. This is Council House Crackdown. Today, a house of horror, the family home abandoned nearly two decades ago. This could be given to someone who's in dire need of, of social housing and it's just being left to rot. A continental con as a property owner in Italy claims homelessness in the UK. She had alternative accommodation that she could live in, whether it be in this country or abroad is irrelevant. And the mystery of the missing tenant. I could see from knocking and looking through, the place had been emptied, uh, completely emptied. Housing investigators have many powers to help them root out tenancy cheats. They can access bank records, check utility bills, and share data with other organisations. But sometimes a case comes to light through something much more simple, like a tip-off from a neighbour or a contractor carrying out a routine gas inspection. This is Chamberlain Road in Kensal Rise, once dubbed the hippest street in Europe by Vogue magazine. It was on this street that Brent Council's head of fraud, David Verma, uncovered a £10,000 subletting scandal that went undiscovered for almost two years. Now, this is a pretty nice area, isn't it, Dave? It certainly is. This is Kensal Rise, North West 10. The area's generally up and coming. It's become quite gentrified and quite expensive to live in. A one-bedroomed private rental property in this part of London can cost £300 a week so demand for council property is high. There are currently more than 5,000 people on Brent's social housing waiting list. Housing has never been in such demand in London, um, in Brent as well. Mm -hmm. And when we don't have the spaces to, to allocate to people, they have to be placed into temporary accommodation or we have to help them in some other way. Mm -hmm. On the 30th of May 2005, 38-year-old Harry Lambert was one of the lucky applicants granted a one-bedroom flat in this swanky corner of northwest London. And at that time, nothing untoward? Absolutely nothing. So when was it that things started to take a turn and you got a bit more suspicious? Well, it's quite an interesting case, actually, because this one came to light through some partnership working with some security guys. Brent Council is required to carry out annual gas safety checks on each social housing property in the borough. In 2016, it was Mr Lambert's turn to be paid a visit. But there was a problem. Try as they might, engineers could never seem to catch Mr Lambert at home. Sometimes tenants don't let us in early enough to do the gas safety check, and we have to go along with security people. On the next visit, a locksmith was on hand to gain access and security manager Richard Barella accompanied him for safety reasons. So, Richard, do you normally have to keep your eyes peeled when you're going on these routines with the gas engineers? Yeah, you generally do. I mean, most of the time it's, it's people that we actually we, we know quite well because we've been doing them for quite a few years. As a long-standing resident at the property, Mr Lambert was a tenant that Richard knew well. Whenever I'd go round, they'd always complain 
that, you know, the place is too small for him, he's his family, blah, 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 blah. So when Richard knocked on the door and it was opened by a Chinese man and his wife, he assumed that Harry Lambert had finally moved out. So I thought, yeah, brilliant, he's been moved on, he's got, you know, he's got a bigger flat or whatever. So I said, oh, are, you, are you new tenants? And they said, no, we're here, we're, we're just friends of the, of the tenant, you know, we're, we're visiting and the place was absolutely full of stuff. So I thought, no, well, that's not right, you know, and I've heard that, that thing about friends before. The evidence suggested that Harry Lambert was no longer living at the flat. Richard suspected that Mr Lambert had in fact moved out and was now subletting his council property to someone else. This was fraud. And obviously then you guys launch an investigation, don't you? Yeah. The investigators requested credit checks on Harry Lambert, looking for any evidence confirming that he was now living at another address. But Mr Lambert had done a good job of covering his tracks. Well, what we've got here is the credit check report for Harry Lambert at his property. And as expected, there's plenty showing um, that he was there. Mr Lambert had made sure that bills for gas, electricity and council tax were still being sent to the Chamberlain Road property and addressed in his name. He was very meticulous, actually, in making sure that everything stayed at that address. Right. So we didn't immediately see from this that he had other addresses or he's living elsewhere. I see. Enough activity on this was going yeah. on. However, um, what it did show was that other people also had activity there. Investigators unearthed mobile phone bills addressed to people at Mr Lambert's flat who were not listed on council records. These were not friends of Harry Lambert, they were subtenants. He was very clever in leaving a lot of his credit activity at this address, mm. um, but the fact that other people had activity there, that was a key indicator. Once we find that the wrong people are in residence, the next stage is normally visits, okay. unannounced visits. And you made three unannounced visits yeah. to this property initially, didn't you? What did you find? Yeah. Well, unfortunately, no one opened the door and there was a little spy hole um, which people could see through. So we weren't sure if we were being looked at and the door not being answered. So do you think possibly there could have been people there, but they were too scared to answer the door or? There's a high possibility that was the case. And on the fourth visit, someone did answer the door. Yeah. Well, we finally got um, a response, and it soon transpired that the lady who opened the door was living there with her husband and also her sister, and that they were innocent parties. They genuinely believed they were renting the property from Harry Lambert. The news that they were in fact living in the council property unlawfully was a complete surprise. So they, they had no idea? No. That must have been devastating for her. She was genuinely shocked and it soon transpired to her that she'd been a victim in all this and that it was very much going to affect her in terms of not having somewhere to live. And this is the thing, isn't it, Dave? You know, people think that tenancy fraud is a, a victimless crime, but you've got a, a tenant here in this property that had no idea... No idea. Of, ..of what was happening. That must have been incredibly upsetting for her and her family. Very much so. Very, very difficult for her indeed. The subtenants were eventually able to secure alternative accommodation. Harry Lambert, a council tenant awarded social housing in good faith, had been revealed as a fraudster. When investigators examined his bank records, the full extent of his greed was laid bare. These very much show rent coming in. Yeah, so you've got the money in, £880. Yep. That's right. That's a significant sum of money. Well, that's in stark contradiction to what he was paying. He was paying around half of that per month. Harry Lambert was paying Brent Council £435 a month in rent. He was unlawfully charging his subtenants 880. So he was charging double, he was making double? Yeah. Amazing. Bank statements revealed that Harry Lambert had been subletting his flat for nearly two years, receiving nearly £10,000 in unlawful payments. When you think of people like Harry Lambert, what do you think the main reason is for them doing something like this? Well, the rents are high, they've seen an opportunity, and they think they're not going to get caught.
Unfortunately for Mr. Lambert, the authorities were wise to his deception. When he saw what we had, he was very keen to sign what we call a tenancy termination form. He wanted to hand the property back. Right. Take it. Just take yeah. it. Did he think that that would sort the whole situation out? He could well have been thinking that that would hopefully put it to bed. Yeah. But it didn't, did but it? But it didn't, no. Brent Council decided to prosecute, and on November the 15th, 2016, Harry Lambert appeared at Brent Magistrates Court. He was given a three-month weekend curfew, ordered to pay costs and fined £9,276, the money he'd received in unlawful rent after nearly two years of defrauding the council. Thanks to the efforts of investigators and an eagle-eyed security guard, Harry Lambert was brought to book, and the property he didn't need can now be given to someone who does. Essentially, Richard, if it wasn't for you, the team wouldn't have known about this because you went there, you were able to report on it. Are you, you know, a bit of a local hero now in the area? No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 far from it. Keep it low key. Thank you very yeah. much. <laughs> it's just a shame that it had to happen in the first place because, you know, as you've said before, you've got a long social housing waiting list. Absolutely. So, really, you don't need people being greedy, charging double the amount of rent and... We could do without that. Yeah, exactly. If you have a social housing property, it's supposed to be your sole and principal home. And if you're going to be away for a prolonged period, you're expected to notify the council. But as we'll see, tenants aren't always as forthcoming as they might be. This is Friar Park, four miles south of Warsaw in the West Midlands. And it was here that tenancy fraud investigators witnessed a shocking abuse of social housing that spanned nearly two decades and led to evidence of animal cruelty. That must have been a pretty awful day. Yeah, it was, it was disgusting. It was one of the worst visits I've ever been on. The story began in February 2015, when lead investigator Leo Malley began to have concerns regarding one of Sanwell Council's three-bedroom family properties. So, Lee, this is the property. Tell me a bit more about it. What kind of person is it suitable for? Um, it's suitable for a family. It's a three-bed property, nice big uh, living room, decent-sized kitchen, bathroom, so, and the garden's huge as well. Over 1,700 people have been listed as homeless in Sandwell over the last three years. Ensuring council properties are rewarded to those in greatest need is a permanent challenge for Sandwell council leader Steve Ealing. But we've got everyday ordinary families who are having difficulty uh, accessing affordable, decent housing as their permanent home. And the, the housing crisis that we've got in the country has, has worsened that situation. When authorities received a tip-off concerning the long-standing tenant residing at the property in Friar Park, they immediately opened an investigation. We started our investigation as it had been reported the, the lady in question wasn't living at her address. Authorities were concerned. If the woman wasn't living at the property, where was she? Investigators hit the streets to find out the truth. So you spoke to the neighbours. What did they tell you? The neighbours initially didn't want to get involved. Um, they didn't want to provide any statements to, to us, which made our job that little bit harder. But what the neighbours did reveal suggested precious council property had been lying dormant for nearly two decades. They did tell us that the the neighbour in question, and she hadn't actually lived at the address for 19 years. 19 years? That is an incredible amount of time. When they told you this, what did you think? I was, I was really surprised, yeah, because it's the longest period I've known while I've been doing this job where someone hasn't lived at their address. Investigators pulled the files on the Friar Park property. The woman was listed as taking on the tenancy in January 1992. If what the neighbours were saying was accurate, the woman had moved out three years into her tenancy, but had neglected to inform the council. This was a serious breach of her tenancy agreement. 
Investigators were determined to track the tenant down, and it was then that they learned some surprising information. According to the neighbors, the woman was returning to the house once a week to feed her cats. A council property intended for a family had apparently become home to a family of cats. The neighbor said she came back once a week uh, just to feed the cats and then she would stay there for a little while and then leave the property. So when the neighbours were telling me this, I mean, it's, it's quite strange to think that uh, there's cats in the property without anyone else living there. Yeah, that's right. Um, I'm not 100% sure whether she used to let the cats out or, or whether she used to just leave them in the property, but there was no cat flaps on the door, so obviously that just raised our concerns. Well, that's it. It's raising concerns and alarm bells, really, isn't it? Because it's quite a strange scenario. Yeah. Authorities were now not only worried about one of their properties not being put to proper use, but also the welfare of any animals inside the house. Investigators knew that if the woman was returning to the property once a week, there was a good chance she was still living nearby. One of the neighbours mentioned to us uh, the name of the partner or friend who she may be staying with. Uh, using the council records, I located that person. She, she was actually in that address. So you managed to identify her there? Yeah. When Lee confronted the woman, she denied abandoning the property 19 years earlier and claimed to be staying with her partner temporarily because she was unwell. And you told her that you wanted to make a visit to this property, didn't you? That's right. Um, she refused because she said she was too ill. Uh, but the person she was living with at the time she allowed him to come and show me around the property. Later. You don't know what you're going to get on the other side of the door. Investigators uncover evidence of animal cruelty. Oh, my gosh. Just awful. Cambridge in the east of England, an historic university city on the banks of the River Cam. Employment levels here are high and house prices have risen by more than a third since 2013. There's huge demand for social housing and concern that many can't afford to live in the city where they work. I'm quite lucky that I have a council house and I've been a tenant for 18 odd years, but even then I don't think I'll ever be able to afford to buy outright. But look after what you've got. It's a gift when someone gives you one of these counts oases. Don't abuse it, but if they're going to abuse it, move them out, move them on. It was here that investigators faced off against a fraudster attempting to swindle authorities out of precious social housing in a continental con spanning 900 miles. James Stevens is head of fraud for Cambridge City Council. In 2016, his colleagues at the housing office were contacted by a woman in apparently desperate circumstances. In this particular case, we had a mother and her children who presented themselves as homeless to us. The woman's name was Lubna Hamidouche. There are 11,000 people currently sat on the social housing waiting list in Cambridge. But as a single mother with three children, Mrs. Hamidouche was moved to the top of the queue. So when she presented herself to the city council, everything about her application suggested that she had a genuine right to be accommodated by Cambridge City Council. And we were very pleased to do that because that is our role. Immediate measures were taken to house this young family in temporary accommodation, while authorities began processing Mrs. Hamidouche's tenancy application. It's not intended to be a long-term accommodation unit. It's just so that the person is in a secure, safe environment while we establish what type of accommodation they should be housed in. Mrs. Hamidouche was offered temporary accommodation in a two-bedroom first-floor flat in Ditton Fields. Housing officers could rest easy, knowing that a single mother and her young family were safe. But just days after she was handed the keys to her temporary property, investigators received a tip-off from a housing officer. Concerns were raised about whether all of the children were still living with the mother. So it was actually passed to us to try and establish whether all the children were there or not. On her housing application form, Mrs. Hamidouche claimed to be taking care of all three of her children. 
But once the family had moved into their temporary accommodation, her eldest daughter was conspicuously absent. Authorities began to suspect that Lubna Hamidouche was attempting to secure a larger property than she actually needed. Lead investigator Chris Schofield contacted the local school where the eldest daughter was registered to see if they knew where she was. I asked them to confirm exactly the attendance of the daughter so we could establish that she was actually part of the household. And the school confirmed to me that since the start of the new school term, she hadn't actually attended that school at all. Something didn't fit. Mrs. Hamadouche's eldest daughter wasn't at school. Investigators began to suspect that she wasn't with her mother at home either. Well, this is an Italian family, mother and children. So when we didn't have any luck identifying where she was, we then contacted the Italian authorities. Investigators contacted housing offices in Italy and asked if they had any land registry documents on the Hamadouche family. We actually then received information back from them in relation to property owned. The email actually states that Mrs. Hamadouche is the owner of a property in Italy, in Gedi, which is a province in northern Italy. It's shown as her main home, her main place of residence. And what's more, information suggested that Mrs. Hamidouche's eldest daughter was living at the address. If the information was accurate, a woman who'd presented herself as homeless and vulnerable in the UK actually owned a property 900 miles away in the town of Gedi in Italy. Later. She knew that she had been caught out. A fraudster is forced to confront her crime. She admitted it, became very upset. Earlier in Sandwell, investigators received reports that one of their tenants had abandoned her council property in Friar Park 19 years earlier. 19 years. That is an incredible amount of time. It's the longest period I've known while I've been doing this job where someone hasn't lived at their address. The woman claimed to be still living at the property, but neighbours said she returned just once a week to feed her cats. It was time for investigators to find out what was going on behind closed doors at Friar Park. We pulled up out the front of the property. The garden was overgrown on the front. The grass was probably about three foot tall. All the signs suggested the property had been abandoned. It was obvious from the state of the property when even before we got inside, it was obvious no one was living there. But nothing could prepare investigators for what confronted them when they opened the front door. The smell of cat feces just hit you as soon as you walked in. It wasn't a very nice smell and it was visible. When you walked into the living room, you could see cat sick, cat feces all in the hallway in the living room. So there were cats, from what the neighbours have said, they were correct, there were cats in, in the property. Yeah, it was horrible. Could they actually get out? Um, from what I saw, it, there were no cat flaps. Um, but I witnessed one of the cats in the property and the breathing of the cat uh, wasn't good. The investigators contacted the RSPCA to take care of the cat and then proceeded to document the condition of the house. You just describing it to me, it sounds... Disgusting, really. You've got pictures, haven't you, from, yeah, yeah. Um, from what it was like? We've got some pictures here. Um, these are some of the pictures which were taken inside the house when we conducted our visits. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. The photos of the property paint a horrifying picture of neglect. Cat feces and vomit on the beds, the carpets, and throughout the house, and a precious council property left to decay for nearly two decades. I honestly can't imagine how awful it must have been to, to go into a property like that. One, it's, you know, completely been destroyed and, and being wasted. Two, there's an incredibly sick animal that appears to be trapped in the property. And three, you're having to go around, take pictures, 
you know, the smell, it's, it's incredibly unhygienic. It's on so many levels, that must have been a pretty awful day. Yeah, it was, it was disgusting. It was, it was probably the last visit of the day. Um, and like I say, one of the worst visits I've ever been on. It must have made you angry. Yeah, definitely, because, it, like I say, you, you could have a family living there, mm. um, and it's just, it's just gone to waste. To investigators, the evidence was clear. A council tenant hadn't lived in the property for years and had no need of social housing. But when they invited the woman to terminate her tenancy, she refused, informing investigators that she would be contacting her solicitor. What were you thinking at that point? Um, it was just laughable, to be honest, at that point, because you've got photos of what you've seen in the property. Um, I've got my colleague with me. Neighbours had told me what had been going on for 19 years. And basically, you just think, I'll pass that to our legal department, let them have a look at it, and they can draw up any notices that need to be served. The investigators prepared a case to have the woman's tenancy revoked in civil court. But just days later, the tenant appeared to have a change of heart. On February the 22nd, 2015, she handed over the keys to a home that had been left to decay for 19 years. With this case, it's quite upsetting to see. There are people out there who would absolutely love a property and need a property like this. Yeah, I mean, you saw the, you saw the size of the garden. It's a three-bed house. Children could be playing in that garden. They, it could be a happy family home. Later. I heard the house was in a bad way before we had you. An astonishing new chapter in the life of the Sanwell property. It should be loved and looked after, and it should have happy memories here. Go! Yay! <laughs> Earlier in Cambridge, housing officers offered temporary accommodation to Mrs Lubna Hamidouche. Everything about her application suggested that she had a genuine right to be accommodated, and we were very pleased to do that only to uncover evidence suggesting that she already owned a property 900 miles away in the town of Gedi in Italy. The email actually states that Mrs. Hamadouche is the owner of a property in Italy. It's shown as her main home, her main place of residence. If what investigators had learned was true, Mrs. Lubna Hamidouche could be guilty of fraud. At the moment, we have serious suspicions she has this property here that she has failed to declare to us. It was time to speak to Mrs Hamadouche to find out the truth. So as far as we were concerned, the evidence showed that she had actually made herself intentionally homeless, which meant that she had no right to be accommodated here in Cambridge, either in temporary accommodation or in permanent accommodation. But when authorities confronted Mrs Hamadouche, she contested their reading of the evidence. She denied the facts and she took up her legal right to appeal our view, which meant that the matter had to be passed to an independent assessor. By law, Mrs. Hamadouche would be allowed to remain in her temporary accommodation until the appeal process was concluded. And that's when the file landed on my desk to kind of consider whether the council had made the right decision. Minos Perdios works for Housing Reviews Limited. His role is to make an independent assessment when a housing applicant appeals against a local authority ruling. He needed to decide whether Cambridge City Council's assertion that Mrs Hamadouche had made herself intentionally homeless was correct. Mrs Hamadouche claimed that the property in Italy had belonged to her parents, but they had since emigrated to Morocco. She no longer had access to any property in Italy. We felt that could be quite plausible, and therefore we started to make inquiries. But when Mrs Hamadouche failed to provide any flight documents to prove her parents had emigrated, or any bills to show the Moroccan address, Minos began to doubt her story. At that point, we then really started to get a gut feeling that she was either withholding information or actually making some full statements. And when Minos contacted the Italian land registry, he discovered that the property in Gedi was still registered in the name of none other than Mrs. Lubna Hamadouche. The evidence was in stark contrast to what Mrs. Hamadouche had claimed on her tenancy application. 
If I show you this paragraph here, it clearly says, do you or anyone on your application own, part own, or lease any residential property other than that given as the current address on this form, include any property you have abroad? Mrs. Hamadou has clearly answered that question, no. This was a lie. The issue here was that she had alternative accommodation that she could live in, whether it be in this country or abroad is irrelevant. She had other alternatives. At the point that she applied to be housed, so it wasn't an accurate statement. So she gave us false information. But the authorities had no option but to allow Mrs. Hamadouche to remain in her temporary accommodation until the appeals process had run its course. By now, she'd been living in temporary accommodation provided by the council for more than a year. Total cost to the taxpayer, nearly £10,000. Armed with the evidence, investigators didn't waste any time. Mrs Hamadouche came into the council for an interview under caution. Initially, Mrs Hamadouche seemed, seemed very calm and collected. Um, as the questioning proceeded towards asking her about her property, she knew that she had been caught out. A few minutes later, she admitted it, became very upset, admitted that she owned the property, admitted that she had lied to us in order to gain a council house. And she told us she knew that if she had told us, she wouldn't have got one. This information, obviously, that Mrs Hamadouche was giving us was the exact information that we then needed to see that an offence of making a false statement had been committed. And then the council could then make inquiries into evicting Mrs Hamadouche from the temporary accommodation as soon as possible. Once authorities had taken back possession of the property, they pressed charges for fraud. On the 14th of July 2016, Mrs Hamadouche appeared before Cambridge magistrates. She pleaded guilty to fraud by deception, was ordered to pay costs, given a nightly curfew and a four-month prison sentence, suspended for a year. This is a great result for us, both for the City Council and for the taxpayers and local residents of Cambridge. In this case, the lady had occupied this, this accommodation unit for more than a year, and we were desperate to free it up and make it available for people who desperately needed it. So from that point of view, feel privileged that we've made, managed to make a difference to people's lives and make something available that needed to be there for the public and the residents of Cambridge. Our next case began when a letter arrived at Wandle Housing Association in Southwark on Valentine's Day 2017. But this was no love letter. Instead, it was an anonymous tip-off, claiming that someone had unlawfully taken over a dead tenant's flat. Fraud prevention specialist Robert Kleinberg was the investigator who had to unravel the mystery of the Valentine's Day letter. We had an anonymous letter that came through and it was addressed to our chief exec. Uh, normally it goes to a particular department, but this one was specifically to our chief exec and it was a friend of the tenant. The chief executive of Wandle Housing is Tracy Lees. Having received that letter, um, I asked our housing team to go and, 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 and verify the facts because sometimes people might have some sort of an agenda. Um, actually, the facts don't stand up to scrutiny. The tenant in question was living here, in Camberwell, South London. Property prices here are high, even by London standards. Two-bedroom flats routinely fetch more than half a million pounds. As such, the need for social housing is even greater. And where there's demand, there's deception. There's such a high demand for social housing in certain central areas of London that there are an element or a certain demographic that will capitalise on that. There are people who are just outright out there to manipulate the system. And I think that's totally unacceptable that people would seek to profit from other people's kind of housing need and kind of housing, uh, housing misery. The author of the letter claimed to be a friend of the tenant who was an older lady living alone. A quick check of council records confirmed the story. 
The tenant we had in this uh, property had been there for several years, so there was no reason to question it or anything for it to pop up on our radar as anything suspicious going on. But examining the rest of the letter, investigators became concerned. The author claimed that the lady had recently died and a younger man, who she'd previously taken in as a lodger, was now living at the property alone. On the housing file, we had no notification that the tenant had passed uh, or that there was anybody else living there with her. So it was then passed to me to look into. If the letter was accurate and the lady had died, who was this mystery man and why hadn't he informed Wandel Housing that he'd taken up residence in one of their properties? The first point of call for me was to do an early unannounced visit. Um, bearing in mind that the allegation was that there was a male living there. It's a single dwelling with a female who's aged in her 60s. Um, I was just going to see what, what, what happens. Rob arrived at the flat on the morning of February the 22nd. We didn't know what to expect, really. Everything on file, as I said, indicated that um, our tenant should be there, but the letter obviously stated of otherwise. So knocked on the door, uh, no initial answer. Um, so I knocked again. Eventually, a chap answered the door. And really didn't want to speak to me at all. The tenant listed on council records was a woman in her early 60s. The person who answered the door was a man in his mid 30s. It appeared that whoever sent the anonymous letter to Wandel Housing had been telling the truth. When I explained that it was social housing and that, you know, what Wandle's involvement was with it, the social landlord, he didn't want to answer anything and left abruptly saying that he was late for work. He just said, I'm sorry, I'm off, and away he went. I uh, informed him that we won't let this go, we'll be returning uh, and we'll be issuing letters to the tenant and to the occupant to get in contact as a matter of urgency. It, clearly, he didn't want to speak to me, so out he came, shut the door behind him and, and went, and I was having to explain to him the reason why I was there as he was left. When investigators studied council records, they discovered that no rent had been paid on the flat for four months. Whoever this mystery man was, he was unlawfully residing at a property he wasn't entitled to. On March the 7th, Rob returned to the property, and this time he wouldn't be accepting any excuses. Then on the second visit, if I come earlier, he might be in such a rush to leave and he may engage and talk with me. I knocked on the door, again had no answer. Knocked again, I couldn't hear anything, no answer. So I just put my hand in the letterbox and just called through to explain it was me calling again. It was then that Rob knew that he was already too late. I could see from knocking and looking through, the place had been emptied. Uh, completely emptied. Rob's mystery tenant had vanished. It was almost four months that that individual could have been living in that property, to all intents and purposes for we know, completely rent free, or paying a someone else for the uh, getting hold of the keys and having access to the property. Inside the property, there were no clues to the identity or whereabouts of the missing man. But just 24 hours after leaving a contact card on the property door. Rob received a phone call from the daughter of the original tenant. She was completely unaware of the unlawful activity going on at her mother's old flat. She came and met me. She explained that her mother had passed away at the latter part of last year. I apologised that she hadn't been in contact sooner, but I pressed her about who was this gentleman that was living here, and she had no, no understand, no knowledge of him at all. So, um... For us, in that, in that regard, it was quite straightforward. We managed to get the keys back. And yes, we now have vacant possession of the property. There are currently more than 12,000 households on Southwark's housing register. Thanks to the author of an anonymous letter, Wandle Housing, have one more property to offer to someone in genuine need. In a situation like this is great where we can have a quick turnaround of getting pos vacant possession back, is that the, the repairs team can come in, give it a fr fresh lick of paint, change the locks, new flooring down, and it's ready relatively quickly for uh, a new tenant who needs it to come in and, and start living in as a home. The important thing for us is that when we get letters like the one that we got or we get anonymous emails, we seek to recover the property. This is a great end result for us. We're going to have a new tenant who's in housing need, living in a new home. Job done. 
the identities of the missing man and the author of the letter that led to his undoing remain a mystery. With such a desperate shortage of social housing, every property that's reclaimed and relet can make the world of difference to someone on the waiting list in need of help. Amy Grice was struggling in cramped conditions with her partner and two small children in a one-bedroomed flat in Sanwell. My daughter was obviously in our room. My son was in his own room. We had to climb six flights of stairs. The lifts was always breaking down, so I'd have to trail down the stairs with him in his pram. I felt in real, real need, but I waited, and I was patient about it, and eventually I did get the property. That property was the one recovered by Sandwell Council when they discovered that its sole inhabitants were the previous tenant's family of cats. After nearly two decades of neglect, the property was completely uninhabitable. But thanks to Sandwell Council and some hard work from Amy and her partner, it now looks like this. I heard the house was in a bad way before we had it. Um, when we moved in here, everything was replastered. The house was perfect. The only downfall was, was the back garden. There was a lot of mess left. Amy and her partner have cleared and leveled the back garden to make it child friendly. It's back breaking work, but the end is in sight. It was really bad. The council gave us a skip. We filled that. We had pedal bikes, motor bikes, uh, engines, bits of cars. I, over I overfilled it. <laughs> it's hard work, but the work's worth it. It's worth it to see your children's face at the end of it and say, yeah, that's my home. Ready? Go! Yay! Do you want to get your scooter now? The day I found out I was getting the place, um, I was really shocked. It felt like it didn't feel real. It, I was around the school dropping my son off when I had the call um, to come and view the property, and it was like, is this really happening to me? I was over the moon. I just want to live here forever. Obviously, once I've done all the hard work, obviously, the jump? garden will be prepared for the grandkids, obviously, later, later days, you know what I mean? Oh. Now it's a few years away, but I'm trying to make it all kid friendly. In the council property, we've actually made it our home, somewhere for our kids to say, yeah, we've grown up there. Our mum and dad have done the best for us in that council property. If you brought the property and you do it up, that's how a council house should be. It should be loved and looked after, and it should have happy memories here. Seeing an abandoned and neglected house being reclaimed and transformed into a home fit for a young family is inspirational. And each time this happens, it represents a small but important victory in the ongoing war being waged across the UK on tenancy cheats. <laughs>